I'm just curious, how many of you enjoy traveling? Any of you like to travel? It's, it's funny to me. You hear people say things like this when they travel. They, when they travel, they want to they find a place that makes them feel just like home. You know, and then when they, uh, when they go there, they say things like, I just can't wait to get back home, you know, and that's sort of how the, the thing is sometimes, but I enjoy traveling. We've had opportunity uh, since my family and I have moved out to California to do a little bit of traveling, and there's a lot more that I would like to do. It's a great state, a lot of things up north way that I would like to see and those type of things, and we've been able to go to San Francisco. My wife and I slipped away last year, just the two of us, and that was an enjoyable trip, had a good time. But I enjoy traveling, and those of you that do enjoy traveling, there's something exciting about seeing new places and new things, and most of the time when you go traveling, though, I don't know if you're this way, but people make a list of things they want to do while they're there, and uh, sometimes if you're not a planner, you can just sort of go and off the cuff and see some things, but uh, my wife especially likes to, to chart out what at least one or two things that, that we want to do on those particular days, and we just want to make sure that when we go, we're going to do these things that we have on this. We've got to do these things. These are the things that we want to do. And uh, we like historical places. I remember years ago, we were able to go to Washington, D.C. and had a great time just spend uh, hours and days looking through the monuments and the rich history uh, of our nation in Washington, D.C. And just had a, had a good time there. But I enjoy traveling. And one of the things that I really enjoy, and my wife can tell you this as well, is I'm not very good with directions. Now, I'm not talking about that if you tell me what to do, I, I can't follow that, or if I don't have a sheet that tells me what to do, but my natural instincts don't really bode well when I travel. Uh, you know, I remember one particular time we were traveling somewhere in North Carolina. It's a place we'd never been, and we were trying to get to, uh, you know, Christians don't go to the beach, we go to the coast, so we were trying to get to the coast where the water was, and, and I remember that we went a, a wrong way, and I said, no, 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 it, this looks like it's going to go this way, and it ended up being a dead end and a very bad part of town, and let's just say it improved our prayer life. We were praying really hard to try to find a way out of there very fast. Uh, but, you know, I, I, what I mean is I'm just not good with directions when I don't have them. Now, we've been blessed through the years. We've made vast improvements on that the old maps we don't have to do that I when I was in uh, college going back and forth I used the giant road atlas and I remember I, I loved it it was just the right size to grab the edges and your steering wheel and you could keep it in front of you the whole time and drive and I did that many a time thanks be to God I, I didn't get in an accident but uh, uh, I used the atlas and then of course today we have GPS and can I get an amen for GPS's when when they work correctly you know um, <laughs> I just love that recalculating, recalculate. Sometimes I do that just to say, I want to see if you can do that, you know, and just keep going my own way. But I, I enjoy GPSs, and, and the great thing about GPS is it's really easy to follow. It just sort of gives us, the, in fact, the, the slogan, turn by turn directions. It just tells you when to do, when, when to do that, at what time to do that. And it basically gets you from point A to point B, from where you are to where you want to be. And it's a great invention of mankind and when we travel many of us use a gps and when we when we come to our text this morning we're finding the children of israel in a place that we've talked about uh quite a few times before in the history and the life of israel this is probably one of a couple of my favorite passages i'm really fond of this crossing of the jordan river i'm also fond of when they crossed over the red sea and went through that and there's a lot of great lessons for us in those particular crossings when it deals with our life. But when, when, when it comes to the children of Israel's journey from slavery in Egypt to the promised land, it's really similar to the journey that you and I take as a Christian. If you've trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, there was a day when a journey of faith in your life began. You began a journey of faith. Whether you realize that or not, it was a New road to you, a brand new start for many of you. Excitement, uh, maybe some, some fearfulness about what the future would hold, but it, you began a journey of faith. Maybe I'm talking to some of you today who are members of First Baptist Church, and I want to remind you, on the day that you voluntarily joined to this body of believers and you decided, hey, I agree with the doctrine and direction of this church, you also began a journey of faith with other believers as a part of this church. So I want you to have that in your mindset today that when we're talking about this journey 
of the children of Israel, I want you to think of application-wise for you personally as a Christian, but also as a member of First Baptist Church. We're all on a journey. Can we be in an agreement of that? I don't know where you are on your journey, but we're all on a journey. And when it comes to the children of Israel at this particular point, they're on the doorstep of entering the promised land. They've just concluded 40 years of wandering. The old disbelieving generation has passed off the scene, and now they are ready to enter the promised land. And I want you to notice their perspective on it. Look at Joshua chapter 2 and verse 24. I want you to see how they describe what lies before them on this journey, as we've already said, was through a, really an area that they've not been through before. But notice how they describe it in chapter 2, verse 24. Truly the Lord hath delivered into our hands all the land, for even all the inhabitants of the country do faint because of us. So as they are on the doorstep of this vast promised land that most of what lies ahead is unexpected to them, and they're not sure what all it's going to involve, they've, they've espied it out a little bit, but they don't know everything about it. How they describe it is really as a grand opportunity. They said, man, look at all that lies before us, and God has already prepared some things that we are going to benefit from. God is waiting for us to go in and claim the, the land, and we are ready to do what God is leading us to do. Can I tell you that in your life, your perspective has a lot to do with your journey? Uh, I thought it was very timely and very appropriate at men's prayer on, on Saturday. Yesterday morning, Brother uh, Bob Eggie shared a devotion, and he dealt with that, of looking at opportunity versus obstacles. And in life, you're going to have things that come up on your way that you did not plan for. Have you learned that? You ever been traveling, had a flat tire, had a blowout, had something take place that maybe detoured you for a good long while? It wasn't on your agenda. Can I tell you that when those things happen to me, immediately my attitude is not, hallelujah. <laughs> Normally my attitude is, are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, I don't like things that I don't plan on most of the time. In fact, we've invented that. They're called interruptions. Don't interrupt me. I'm busy. I have my own plans. I've got my own agenda. And if we're not careful, sometimes opportunities of God can be viewed as interruptions by you and me. I don't have time for that. What, what is, what, why can't people just leave me alone so I can serve God? <laughs> we have that attitude sometimes. I wish people would just bother me so I can minister, you know? And, and we get this idea that Sometimes things are merely interruptions and they're not part of the journey ha God has for us. I want to tell you, God's people respond in a great way to what takes place in their life. And I want to admonish you today that we need to have the right perspective as individuals and as a church family during this time. You ever looked at something and just was amazed by it? Maybe a sculpture, a painting? You ever viewed something, and you just immediately thought, man, how did they do that? Incredible. Um, there's some folks that I know on Facebook who have begun to do some woodworking with chainsaws. Any of you seen that where they sculpt with chainsaws? Um, if I did that, you know, I would, I would wave at you like this probably. You know? <laughs> I just, I don't think that would be my knack, but these guys can make incredible things with a chainsaw, you know, and uh, I just saw yesterday, they, and an owl, I mean, a, a, just a beautiful owl, and I thought, how can a person do that? That's incredible. Maybe you've seen a sculpture, a monument, a painting. Let's put, put it into more practical things. Maybe you look at somebody's family, and you think, man, that's such a great family. That's such a good home. How, how do you get something like that? Maybe you look at a church where it seems like Everything they do, God blesses, and, and their attendance is exploding. And, and I'm not talking about because they compromise on the truth of God, but they're doing things that are right, but you're thinking, man, what, 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 how do you get that? You know, sometimes you may have an opportunity to ask somebody who's a painter or a sculptor or somebody in somebody's family, and you say, how, how do you have kids like that? How do you have a church like that? How do you get that? Tell me. Tell me the secret of those things. Maybe there's a recipe in your family, and, you know, it's a cake that people want to kill for because it is so delicious and wonderful. And how do you, how do you bake that cake? How do you make that meal? What is the secret recipe? What is the secret formula behind that? And the truth is, you know what? With many of those type of things, there is no secret formula. 
There's not a one, two, three, twelve steps and you're done kind of formula that you do. A lot of times it's as simple as this, that to get from point A where you are to point B where that thing is you want, what we're missing is the time in between those two points. We forget that there's part of the journey we haven't walked before. There's part of the journey we've got to walk. If we want what, what somebody else has or what the Scripture says God has for us, the only way we can have that in most cases is simply to walk the points between A and B. And if you're thinking along those lines and you're thinking, man, I, just, I would love to have that or I would love for my life to be that or I would love for God to do this or do that, I want you to understand today that we've got to walk the journey that God has for us. You don't just end up in the promised land. <laughs> There's a path to go before you get there. There's things that God plans for us that we don't plan for ourselves, but they're all on the way to getting from here to there. And I want to encourage you this morning as a Christian, as a child of God, I want to encourage you especially this morning, those of you that are members of First Baptist Church, if you're visiting today, I'm so thankful that you're here and I want to encourage you to keep on coming and keep on coming. And if God leads you this way, you make this church your church home. But I especially want to talk to those of us who are members of First Baptist Church this morning because regardless of what you think, we are on a journey and there are things that God has planned for us as a church that we wouldn't often plan for ourselves, but they are part of getting from here to there. And I want us to look at this morning three realities of going from here to there. Things we need to expect to take place if we are going to go from here where we are to there where God wants us to be. We're going to face these three things as the children of Israel did. I want you to see the first thing is when we go from here to there, there's going to be a choice. There's going to be a choice. See, no one ever goes from here to there without choosing to start going that way. Israel had to decide to move where God was leading. They had to decide to head in God's direction. We see that in verse number 3. It says, remove from your place. You know, a lot of problems can develop in your life and mine when we just refuse to change. <laughs> now, do you understand that? That not all change is bad, but that's normally how we view change. Uh, I don't even like the sound change makes. I'm talking about change in your money. I don't even like the, the sound change makes in your pocket. You know, there's, there's some people that hate change that much. I just, now I don't want anything to change here. People say, ah, everything's got to say this. Everybody's got to You can't change anything. If you do, the whole world falls apart, you know. Uh, there's been times in our uh, church services where something has been off kilter. Or we've had to move a song. And I mean, people are, it's like, what happened? <laughs> you know, you can't do this to me. <laughs> and we're creatures of habit. We like what we like, the way we like it, when we, when we like it, and we're, we, just, we just enjoy that. And so we have to understand that not all change is bad, but hear me, not all change is good too, you know? But I want you to understand this as well, that there is some change that is very necessary, but if the choice was left up to you and I to do it, we never would. Uh, just for the sake that, how many of you live in your own home? By, by that, I mean you don't live with your parents. Okay? <laughs> uh, notice I didn't say you don't own your own home. You know, I realized where we are and how much things cost. So I'm just, I was like, you, you live away from mom and dad. <laughs> yeah, you put your hand out. Can I tell you, if I were to ask you what were the circumstances leading to you moving out, many of you have a story to tell, and most of that would involve change. <laughs> you know, because most of us are comfortable. I mean, think about it. Mom folds the laundry, cleans the laundry, food's magically in the cabinet. This is great. Great setup. I mean, who would not want to live that way the rest of their lives? And then you realize that's not how real life is. I remember just a few weeks ago, you pray for us as parents. Our kids are getting older. All my boys are growing up. I don't know what's happening. But they, they just keep getting bigger and bigger and taller and clothes don't fit anymore. And this is just a problem. I keep calling my mom and go, what's going on? You know, I'm, I'm being facetious a little bit, but the point is that they're growing, and I remember that we bought a meal, I think it was a pizza or something that we'd always gotten, and, and they were still hungry and everything was gone. I went, hey, what's wrong with you? My wife said, I think we're going to have to buy more. I said, no, no, they just need to be happy with what they have. <laughs> and I'm realizing now that, no, they're growing. They're, it's, we're going to get into that stage where they're going to eat everything, everything they see. 
I mean, I'm already in the dad mode of, you know, I come home and the things I've bought for me are gone. And my wife said, well, they saw them. So? Uh, try that with your next door neighbor. Man, I mean, they're Lexus. I just saw it. <laughs> that's, it it's not that way. And that's, and that's not how it's supposed to be. But they're growing. They're changing. Things that used to fit don't fit them anymore. That's a good way to adapt that song in life. But that's the point of life. Life changes. Think about that. Things by its very nature do not stay the same. We take pictures to document how things are, but after the moment that picture is snapped, everything changes. I remember one time we were getting a family portrait. Actually, uh, Denton, I think it was when he was our only child at that time. We were taking him to uh, Sears or or a photo place to get his thing, and he had drooled all over his shirt like children are apt to do. And I remember my wife said, oh, wait, 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 oh, she was, you know, we're new parents, didn't know anything, thought everything had to be perfect, you know what I'm saying? Oh, oh, I got to change his shirt, I got to change his shirt. I said, why? She said, well, he's going to take a picture. I said, the kid drools. He always drools. When we see that picture, we're going to tell everybody he drooled and we had to change his shirt, so leave it alone. (laughs) Say, what'd you do? I left his shirt on, we took a picture, and... Now we don't have to tell people. Everybody knows, hey, look, he drooled on his shirt that day. Yep. (laughs) And if we hadn't, we'd still tell people. I'm just saying life is filled with change, and when it comes to us taking our journey from here to there, we're going to have to choose to follow God. And I've learned something through my short 35 years of life is that we all, myself included, we all are pretty comfortable with getting near God's way, but not altogether going His way. The children of Israel camped there three days, and they were content to be there, but God says, guess what? It's time to move. And the water's not going down where it's convenient. It's time to move, and you need to decide something. Are you walking with me by faith now or not? And I want to tell the members of First Baptist Church today, we have a tremendous opportunity that's laid before us as a church family, and we have a decision to make. We have to decide. We have to choose. Are we going to follow God now or not? God's on the move. He's always working. God's work doesn't stop. There's no hiccup. There's no detour. I know many of you think that this is detour, and then one day God's work's going to pick up again. But I'm telling you, just because you don't see Him working doesn't mean He's still not just as actively involved in First Baptist Church as He's ever been. We need to be conscious that if we're going to get from here to there, it's going to take a choice, and God leaves that choice up to you and me. He said, I'm moving. Are you coming with me? But I'm thankful that in these times when we face a choice from God, God gives us His promises. Look at verse number 5. The Bible says, For tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And that was the guarantee from God. He said, listen, here's your choice. Are you going to remove from where you are, where you're comfortable, what you're used to, the way that it's been? Are you going to remove from that and follow me but he said if you choose to do that you're going to see something it's going to blow your mind you're going to see me do some things you never had a chance to see me do before can i tell you that's really the christian life god wants to put us in places where we have to look to him and he wants to show us something about him we've never seen before because we've never been in that opportunity to see it if things never changed We'd never seek God to see those things. We'd never look to Him. We'd never depend on Him. There's got to be a choice, but I want you to see the second thing that it's going to be involved. It's going to involve a challenge. You notice that things in life aren't always easy, (laughs) especially when they're the things that we ought to do. Look at verse number 8. It says, When ye are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, ye shall stand still in Jordan. Look at verse number 13, if you would please. The soles of the feet of the priests, the Bible talks about, they shall rest in the waters of Jordan. See, these priests had a monumental task to do. Their their job was a little bit different than when they crossed the Red Sea. Their job was to actually go in Jordan and stand there. (laughs) 
They were to stay there. They weren't just to walk from point A to point B, but now they were required to stand still in the midst of Jordan. I like the quote by George Mueller. He says this, that God is not only in the steps, but He's also in the stops of our lives. And I think that's the case. Here's a prime example of that. God said, go into Jordan, but while you're in the midst of that, I want you to stand still. Just stop. Now that's a challenge. The Jordan River was swollen at this time. Most people believe it up to, to a mile wide at this particular time. This was not the convenient time to cross. And now this raging river that God had miraculously opened a doorway to, they had to stand in the middle of that holding the ark of God. Notice verse number 17. And the priests that bear the ark stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan. And I admonish, admonish us as a church today that here's, here's what's going to be our challenge as a church family. Our challenge is going to be to stand still in the midst of what's going on. It's going to be to stand in the midst of it. We all are tempted to get tired. We all are tempted to uh, get bored. Uh, things get familiar. Well, it's the old saying, familiarity breeds contempt sometimes. I'm, I'm not naive. I've been privileged to preach God's Word for many, many years since I was a teenager. And I'm not naive to think that everybody loves to hear me preach. Uh, I'm, they don't be naive enough to think that I love having to look at all your faces every, every time I get a chance to, too. So we're even to that degree. But I want you to understand that, that when God called me to preach, He didn't call me to preach to people that liked to hear me preach. When I preach, I don't, don't take offense at this at all. Because I'm glad you're here listening. <laughs> but when I preach, I don't preach for you to hear me. I preach for the Lord. And, and I'm, not, I'm not naive to think that all, everybody likes the way I present truth and my personality. And that's fine because, like I said, some of you, I might not care to go on a vacation with you because of how you, how you are. That's fine. God made us that way. But here's what we have to decide. When we face a challenge of dealing with things we don't really care for, are we going to stand in the midst of it? Are you going to get bored? Well, I heard over there, they got a pretty good, pre you know, he juggles, chain he makes uh, owls out of chainsaw, you know, out of a piece of wood, takes a chainsaw and makes an owl. I think I'm going to go hear that guy. Hey, they got a fellowship this week. I think I'm going to go to Grandma's church. I know I've never missed before, but after all, they got a family reunion. I mean, they got a big thing going on over there. I think, and you know, we don't have a really, we don't really have a pastor right now. So you know, I think, I don't. Yeah, what's the harm in that? Well, I'm gonna tell you what the harm is. Is because are you going to be committed to stand in the midst of what's going on? See, anybody can start. Anybody can initiate a walk in this journey of faith. There's a lot of people who one day decided to follow Jesus Christ. There's a big multitude that would come out by the throngs to hear Jesus. But when it came down to dedication and Jesus Christ told them really what it was going to cost them and require of them and the inconvenience and the discomfort of all of that, when it dealt, I mean, when the rubber hit the road in their own personal life, here's what happened. Most of them left. And he even looked at his most dedicated disciples that day and he asked them a simple question. Will you two also go away? And here's the truth of it. Jesus Christ was determined if no one followed Him, He would still do what God the Father had led Him to do. And I want to tell you, you might not like where we are as a church. You might prefer it differently. You may have planned it a little different. You might already have ideas of what we ought to do and how things should be and the time frame and this and that. But I want to tell you, God's challenge to you and me is are we going to be committed in the midst of things to stay where God has led us? You're going to be just as faithful without a pastor as you were with one? I think you should be more so. Uh, you, know, you know, well, hey, I want a good church. Remember what we talked about? I want a really good church. I want a strong place. I want a wonderful beacon of light on the corner of 10th and Pine. I want that for Long Beach. Can I tell you? That will never happen if you give up in the midst of what's going on. You can't have that without traveling this journey from point A to point B. You're never going to see what God wants to do there if you don't commit to stand in the midst of what God's doing now. I know some of you have already said, eh, I'll be back when you get a pastor and we'll figure out what's going on. And you are going to miss what God is going to do here. If you do come back and God leads His man to His place and things are going great, 
there's going to be part of the journey you missed out on. There's going to be something about God you didn't get a chance to see for yourself. You're only going to hear people talk about it. And I want to tell you more importantly than God wants to part water and let a group of people go across is the fact that this, He wants to show you He is able to help you endure in the midst of things. He wants to be your rock. He wants to be the person who lets you last through it all. And I love this in verse, chapter 4, verse 10. The Bible said they stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished. And can I tell you, that's the challenge that we had. Are we going to stay in the midst of it till it's finished? Not when you think it's finished. Not when you think it ought to be done. But when God decides it's time, are you going to stand firm? And I like that expression. Stand firm till it's finished. And man, what a testimony. What a testimony for God. Hey, there was dangers out there. there. Who knows what might happen? Oh, yeah. But God said, that's what I want you to do. You get, there's got to be a choice. But don't be naive to think it's not going to be a challenge to you personally and a challenge in the life of our church. Hey, there's some people that might just think, hey, what's the problem? Man, we'll find a pastor easy. I mean, we've got a big staff. You know, I've had well-meaning people. I appreciate the thought, but they're, yeah, Brother Doug, I mean, you just jump up there. Almost like it's a throne or something, you know? The, the King Lee, so the next guy in line just tops up there. I'm going to start getting death threats or something. <laughs> it, it doesn't work that way. That's not, hey, I, we're missing the point if, if you've already figured out how to solve it. Because it's not a problem to be solved. It's an opportunity for God to work. And until he finishes his work, it's not done yet. It's not done yet. There's going to be a challenge. Can I share with you the last thing? There's going to be a change. You see, after the children of Israel crossed this Jordan River, their lives would never be the same. They were going to enter the promised land. This was going to be a step of dedication, obedience to God, and God was going to open up and start doing some pretty spectacular things. And I want to tell you that whenever you decide to let God choose the next step of your journey, you're going to choose to remove from what's comfortable and follow Him. And you face that challenge with Him. When His working is finished, you will never be the same. A church will never be the same in a good way. Because you cannot go through an experience like that with God and come out being exactly the same way. You know, time would fail me personally to tell you stories in my own life where by faith I've let God decide for me. That's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to do. And most people think they know what that's about, but until you've ever done it, you really don't know what that's about when you sort of lay it all out there for the Lord and say, God, like David said, you want me to pursue or not? <laughs> and God makes the decision. Can I tell you, every time, every time, every time, you leave the choice up to God, it's always the best. Oh, it might not be what was in your mind. <laughs> it might come out of nowhere. And you think, what? Really? <laughs> I remember that. California? <laughs> I don't think so. Don't they have cows out there? <laughs> California, that's that place where one day it's going to break off and sink in the ocean. That's where all the wacko weirdos go, God. We tell jokes on the East Coast. All the nuts are in California. You know, the fruits and nuts out there, no way. But I want to tell you, none of that really matters when you know that, hey, that's, God says, come on, that's where I want you to be. And I'll tell you, as a Christian, I'm thankful my life is changing. I'm not what I need to be. And we know that expression, thank God I'm not what I used to be. But my desire in life is to always be changing to be more like Jesus Christ. And, and I'm just now realizing the older I get, the harder of a struggle that's going to be on me. Because I like things to stay the same. I like what I like. I'm comfortable. But God often has other plans. But when you follow Him by faith, your life will always be completely transformed. Look at chapter 4 and verse 3. God tells them, take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, 12 stones. 
And I like this expression. If you have, if you have a pen, underline this. Ye shall carry them over with you. Ye shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. I want you to understand this. That there are things God's going to lead you to that you didn't plan on. And you're going to have a choice to follow Him by faith or not. And if you follow Him by faith, you're going to go through in the midst of things, God's going to show you some things about Himself you've never had a chance to see before. And when you come out of those situations, hear me, this is an added blessing of God, you're going to have an opportunity to carry some things along with you to the other side. Hear me, they're, they're secret things. They're buried things. They're things not everybody's going to notice on the surface. I mean, it's a simple little analogy. These rocks were under Jordan. They were in the midst of Jordan. They were buried under water. Nobody walking by would have noticed these things, but these are things that God said, pick out 12 stones, and these ordinary stones that for years had been forgotten, untouched, undisturbed, now were being ripped out of their beds of dirt and clay and muck and mire and carried to the other side. They were given a new purpose, a new identity, some powerful meaning for a bunch of ordinary rocks. Why? Because the children of Israel went through something with God and those rocks were nothing special. But now when they walked by them and saw them stacked up on the shore, they were no more just ordinary rocks. They were testimonies to what God could do with simple things and simple faith. We could get up here this morning and I could tell you names of pastor after pastor that this church has been blessed to have and many of you who had been under their ministry, many of you, your minds would be flooded back with gratitude and with thanksgiving for God, for their influence, for what they did in your life. Many of your homes are back together because of their labor and their ministry. Many of your Christian lives have grown and matured because they've been here. Things are different in your life because God had used them. But hear me, those men are just ordinary things. They're just simple rocks. They're just things that were there that God wanted to use. And the real meaning and purpose is greater than that. God decided to use those simple things to change you. That's why they're special. No man is greater than another man. No influence, no ability, no talent. God needs none of that. But He chooses to use people. And through that, we are changed forever. That's why when you hear names like John Wilkerson and James Allen and Michael Jones, people go, Phew. praise the Lord. Why? Because God took a bunch of simple rocks and took you through a time. And when you got on the other side, you were able to carry some things with you that will last a lifetime. So let me encourage you this morning. God wants to take us from here to there. But there's a choice. You've got to decide, I'm going to go with God or not. Can I encourage you this morning, go with God? But hear me, there's going to be a challenge. It, it might get rough. We might tend to become impatient. We might think things should be different. But the goal is to stand firm in the midst of what God's leading us to until it's finished. And hear me, when we go through it with God, we'll carry some things with us to the other side and we'll forever be changed because of it. I'll tell you, that's the desire I have. I don't want to miss anything God has for me. Oh, I wish I could say I've always gone through everything the way that I ought and carried things with me the way that I should have, but the truth is I haven't. But I'll tell you this, the things I have, I'm forever grateful to Him that He let me do that. I'm better because of it. Oh, I'm not much to look at, but I'm thankful for the journey God's led me on. What about you? So we bow our heads and close our eyes this morning. I want to ask you a simple question today. How many of you by lifted hand today would say, Brother Doug, pray for me because I've been a little indecisive or I've started to decide on things that really are not God's leading during this time of transition. Would you pray for me?